Okay, uh, so with Black Scholes option pricing formula, we made some assumptions. So we assume that the options are European options. There are no dividend payments uh, before the expiration date. Volatility needs to be estimated accurately. Of course, this is almost impossible, but what we do is we look at historical prices and we look at historical volatility. Uh, and of course, there are other assumptions that you don't need to know, uh, but uh, basically we are assuming that stock returns should be log normally distributed, uh, follow geometric Brownian motions, blah, blah, blah. So you don't need to know that at least you're doing, uh, unless you're doing financial math masters or PhD, you don't need to know, know those. Okay, um, now I will show you one example what we're, uh, on what we're going to do if uh, we have dividend paying stocks. So basically uh, what we're going to do is we're going to calculate, calculate the price of the stock. Uh, we, we know the price of the stock, but then we're going to calculate the <coughs> stock price considering the dividend payment. So we're going to calculate the present value of the dividend payment and make the adjustments. So we're going to decrease the present value of the dividend payment from the stock price. Why? Because if a uh, stock is paying dividend, uh, at the ex-dividend date, the uh, stock price will decrease, which will be like a bad thing for the, for the call option holder. So in this case, we are need to deduct the present value of the dividend payment from the stock price. Okay. And the rest of it, the rest of the formula is not going to change. We will just, oh, I erased it. Okay, we will just change the uh, S in the Black-Scholes formula into mm -hmm. S uh, star. That's it. Okay, so if we have a special case where I uh, tell you the, the Q, which is basically the dividend yield compared to the stock value, you're going to calculate the SX using the, this formula. So what is Q? Uh, let's look at this. Q is the uh, stock dividend yield on, uh, until the expiration date. S is the stock price, so we will just adjust the stock price by uh, dividing it by 1 plus Q, and we're going to be uh, done with it. So let's look at this example. Um, the price of the call is given by the standards, I'm um, oh, sorry, worldwide uh, plants will pay an annual dividend yield of 5% on its stock, so Q is 5%. Uh, there is a European call, one year European call option with a strike price of 20 uh, and the volatility of the uh, stock is 20%, one year risk free, uh, risk -free rate is 4%. Okay, so let's try to do this together, but I need the formula, sorry, I erased it for some reason. Let's go back, let me write down the formula for Black Scholes. Okay, so basically, I'm sorry. Okay, here it is. So the price of the call will be this. And D1 will be equal to this. And D2 is, okay, so this is what, what we have. So when you have dividend payment for the stock, I'm going to replace S with S star, that's it. And when I give you the dividend yield, which is what this question does, the only thing you need to do for Sx will be divide S by 1 plus Q, dividend yield, that's it. So let's look at this uh, example now. In this example, the stock price is given, it is equal to 30. Q is given, it is equal to 5%. So uh, I don't have the answer here, so I'm going to write it down. Let's try to do it here. Okay, so what am I going to do? I'm going to start with S star. The stock price is written over there, uh, which is... Oh, it's not given. We are going to assume that the stock price is 30. Could you write it down? Assume that stock price is 30, so which is equal to S. Okay. You can pick any arbitrary number. Uh, the solution is in uh, the, the case where stock price is 30, so that's what I'm going to do. 
So you're going to divide it by 1 plus Q. So this is going to be equal to 2857. After this, the only thing you need to do is plugging all the numbers in the, in the formulas, basically. And what do we know is, let me just write D1. I have ln Sx uh, S star over the exercise price, which is 20. And then I have plus risk rate rates, 4%. And then I have, I need the volatility. What is volatility? 20%. And here, t is equal to 1. It doesn't say anything about it, right? It says 1 year, so t is equal to 1. So from here, okay, over, okay. So from here, d1 should be something like 208. And d2 from this formula, it's going to be, 208 minus the volatility, um, so it's going to be equal to 1.88. So after this, you're going to plug D1 and D2 in this formula. S is the stock price. It's given. We already know the stock price is 20. The risk free rate is 4%. It's given. T is 1. Exercise price is um, 30. Oh, sorry. Stock price is Stock price is 30 and the exercise price is 20, sorry. Okay, so S is 30, exercise price is 20. So from here, you can find the call options price, which will be around 938. So as you can see, when you have dividend payment, you need to just adjust the stock price, okay? So you can do it two ways, where in the first one, you calculate the present value of the dividend payment and deduct it from the stock price. Or if the question gives you the dividend yield, I mean, the, the intuition is the same, but the shortcut will be uh, to use stock price over 1 plus Q. So it will also give you the value of the, um, of, uh, of the stock. Yes? Uh, I'm changing the S to the SX in the, the first one. Actually. Yes. Oh, here, yes. Thank you. And uh, why did you change the 20 to 30 on the... I didn't actually, I just um, said it incorrectly. So I said, assume that stock price is 30, and then I wrote 20 because I saw 20 here. Uh, 20 is the strike price. So here, oh, it should be 20. Oh, thank you, yes, sorry. This is not the stock price, this is the exercise price. Thank you. I thought it was supposed to be the stock price, sorry. That's it. So if you have a dividend paying stock, just adjust the stock price in the formula, then, then you're fine. Everything is the same. Okay. Any questions? We are actually done with the uh, formal part of option pricing. Now I'm going to uh, use this option pricing idea to tell you about Agency, co agency conflicts, mergers, and capital structure. So actually in finance, everything we see is related to options. Uh, and we, are kind of, we kind of ignore it until we introduce the options framework to you. But uh, now we're going to see how stockholder, bondholder relation is all about <laughs> options. Or merger idea can be all about uh, options as well. Um, the last thing I'm going to say before we move to uh, the other stuff is there is no valueless option. That's important. The value of the option is either zero or something higher than zero. So basically, if you know that you're going to lose money, you're not going to exercise the option. So you have that option. Uh, and there's always positive probability that you're going to make money on having an option. So overall, we can say, there is no valueless option, ever. And actually, most of the people in real uh, case, I think I put it in the notes, but I skipped it when I was talking uh, on Tuesday. Uh, most people act actually uh, wait until the expiration date to exercise the option. 
and only I think 30% of the options are not exercised. So options are really valuable in a, in a well-functioning market. Okay, so do you have any questions about calculations? So now let's look at stocks and bonds as in, in the framework of options. And I think this part is kind of interesting because it's kind of my area. That's maybe that's why I like it. So we're going to look at the firm in two different cases. And we're going to look at whether stockholders have a call option or bondholders have a, have a put option and how things will make sense in real world. <coughs> so let's start with this example. There is a company, Besmar company, uh, and its cash flow schedule is like this. There are four uh, cases where you might, I might have very successful projects, moderately successful projects, moderately unsuccessful projects, or failure. And these are the cash flows related to that. And suppose that I have $800 debt payment to the debt holders. So in each case, if I have enough money to pay all of my debt, which is $800, I'm going to pay to debt holders first. You know, they have priority over cash flows. And whatever money is left, is, uh, it goes to stockholders. So in this case, if I have a very successful game, I'm going to have $1,000, 800 goes to the uh, stock uh, debt holders, 200 goes to cash, uh, cash um, uh, stockholders. Thank you. And if I only make $700, my total debt is 800, but I don't have enough cash, so I will pay whatever I have to the debt holders. So 700 will go to uh, debt holders, nothing will go to cash um, stockholders, okay? So it's gonna look like this. So this can be written in options world. So basically this is the cash flow to, to the firm, okay? And this is cash flow that goes to stockholders. <coughs> if the, uh, the, the uh, firm makes less than $800, uh, stockholders will not get any money. If the firm makes more than 800, then actually they will start getting money, right? 800 goes to debt holders, remaining part will go to stockholders. So in this part, what is the, I want you to think in terms of options. What is the underlying assets? So I, when I say options, remember options are derivatives, they're written on an underlying security on, or an asset. So in this example, what is the underlying asset you think <coughs> on the call option? So this looks like a call option, right? Hockey stick diagram. Okay, so in this case, what is the asset? In normal options, we said the asset is stock. Everything. Everything. So the firm did you say everything? I said anything. Like, I said okay, anything. I will take it. Anything and everything will be the, the underlying security. <laughs> so basically, the firm overall will be the underlying asset. And what is the exercise price on this call option? 800, right? So what happens is stockholders, it's kind of like they have a call option where the exercise price is 800. Whereas for bondholders, they own the firm. We can take, uh, think them as the owners of the company, okay? And we kind of can think of think that way. Why? Because they are giving money to the company. In that case, we can take them as the owners of the company, even if we know in real world owners of the companies are shareholders. But still, it makes sense. So in the agency conflicts, agents can change. It is either stockholders or debt holders. It can change the way you look at things. So bondholders own the firm and they're writing a call option to stockholders. Stockholders are not going to exercise their call option on the firm if the firm, if, the, if, if, if stock price is less than the exercise price or if the firm value is less than the exercise price. In this range, stockholders are not going to exercise their options. They, they will just go away, just leave the company, right? And if the firm value is higher than $800 um, exercise price, then they're going to exercise the call option and they're going to make some money. E everything on top of $800 will go to uh, stockholders. 
and they're gonna pay $800 exercise price to bond holders. Do you see the option framework here clearly? Okay, and for the bond holders on the other hand, so they're gonna get their money $800 whenever firm value is higher than 800, but if the firm value is less than 800, then they're gonna get less than their debt. So um, as we get closer to the exercise price, they're uh, they making more money because they, they just uh, wrote, wrote a call option to the stockholders. So you can see stockholder bondholder relationship like this. Stock bondholders own the firm, stock, uh, they write a, a call option to stockholders, and stockholders uh, exercise the, the, their options, call option, only when uh, the firm generates more money uh, than the debt they need to pay off to debt holders. Does it make sense? Okay, I'm not talking about ex uh, unrealistic things. Actually, in real world, this is how this is really how we see firms. Like in academia, this is also how we look at things. Okay, so um, we talk about this. So let's go to the, the other one. Now I'm going to look at everything in the put option framework. Okay. So this time, again, the underlying asset will be the, the total, the entire firm. And the strike price will be the total amount of that they need to be paid. But now we're going to assume that stockholders own the firm and they own a put option, okay? Uh, and they have to pay to bondholders when the debt is due. And bondholders are the seller of the put. So we're changing things a little bit. So what's going to happen is, this time we have a put option that's important. At the maturity of the debt, the, if the assets of the firm are less than the value of the debt, what's going to happen? You're kind of in bankruptcy, right? So shareholders will have an in-the-money put, right? So they are the owners of the put option. In this case, they're going to exercise their put option. And they will leave the, the firm to the bondholders. It's bankruptcy case, debt holders get the firm. If at the maturity of the debt, uh, uh, put option is out of the money, so if the, the, the company makes enough money to cover all the debt, then the, uh, the company will not declare in the bankruptcy and uh, the put option will expire. Nothing is going to happen. So let's look at this one more time uh, in terms of our, our example. So we said shareholders own the firm, so they, they owe $800 to the debt holders. Uh, bondholders sell a put, its exercise price is $800 to, to stockholders. If cash flow is less than $800, the money is not enough to cover all the debt, so the put will be in the money. Shareholders will sell the firm to the bondholders. Okay, they're going to exercise the put option. They're going to sell the company. In the put option, you have the right to sell the stock, right? Here, they're going to sell the firm to the bondholders. Do any money change hands in this case between stockholders and debt holders? Let's see whether you're sleeping or not. Huh? So what happens is they owe money to the, to the debt holders. But they're selling the company actually for debt, so actually there will be no uh, money changing hands. So it's a bankruptcy case. The debt holders will get the stock, which will be uh, enough to cover. Uh, they will get the, the company, uh, which will cover the debt basically, and the firm will be in bankruptcy. If cash flow that is generated is greater than 800, everything's fine. The puts will be out of the money. Shareholders will not sell the firm. They're going to keep the firm and um, they're, they're going to pay $800 payment to the debt holders. So when you look at the firm, you can think of the things uh, like this. This is just a summary slide. I don't want to go over it. We already talked about those. Okay. So we look at the company as like an option. The, the underlying security of an option. In the first case, we said bondholders own the company. They write a call to stockholders. 
And when the money is not enough to cover the exercise price, which is the debt owed to the debt holders, uh, stockholders didn't exercise their call option. They left the company, basically. And the second way of looking at things are stockholders on the firm. And they have a put option on the firm. Uh, so bondholders write a put option uh, to the stockholders. Whenever the money is not enough to cover all the cash that should be paid to debt holders, the company is in bankruptcy. Shareholders sell the company for, mm -hmm. uh, to pay off the debt, basically. So as you can see, you can uh, look at options from this perspective as well, from agency conflict. Uh, OK. And so when you look at equity, when you look at debt as a call option, that's also, we talk about these a little bit, and we're going to talk more about this in the governance section, basically. So I, 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 uh, I think we covered this before. Equity holders, I said, they like risk. Why? Again, think of the option framework. Uh, debt holders are short the uh, put option. They are they're selling the put option. So whenever increases, uh, whenever risk is high, what happens to the value of a of a call or the value of a put? Do you remember when volatility is high? What happens to the value of the put option? Does it increase or decrease? Increase. increase. How about the value of a put option? Does it increase or decrease? Increase. increase. So in both cases, when volatility is high, it's good for uh, option holders. Okay. So when you look at equity as a call option then increased uncertainty is a good thing for shareholders because it's going to increase the value of the call they're holding. When debt holders are selling the put option, they're the sellers of the put option, so the value of put is high, which is a bad thing for the seller, right? So in this case, that all, which also, uh, which is in line with what we said before, shareholders like risk, debt holders don't like risk. Okay, so this can lead to an overinvestment problem or risk shifting problem. Manager increasing the risk of the company, which will increase the call option value. So that's, that's one problem. Another thing is the underinvestment problem. And it happens uh, when uh, the firm, the manager thinks about making new investments. And if part of the new investment's value goes to the debt holders instead of shareholders, then the manager will prefer not to make any investments. So in this case, a company will make less investment than, than optimal. So this is going to be uh, an under, under, um, under investment problem. So you can link uh, options to agency conflicts as well. And you can think of it as uh, in, in the option framework. Uh, now I want to talk about credit default swaps because they're really uh, popular <coughs> in the US and it is uh, getting popular in Turkey as well. So what happens is we talk about credit risk. Do you remember what credit risk is? Yes. What is it? You give a credit, there's a risk, you cannot receive. It is actually bankruptcy risk. Yes. <laughs> okay, credit risk. Okay, so basically, so when you have... Uh, when you have debt, you are also taking some risk on, uh, because of that, because you have the credit risk. So you can uh, also have a put option on the same debt to protect yourself from the bankruptcy risk. So what happens is when there, uh, this is called credit default swap. So when um, in, in a credit default swap, the uh, buyer pays the price to, to buy the puts. And then uh, the, the buyer will receive a payment from the seller in bankruptcy case. So it's kind of protecting yourself from the bankruptcy risk. And let's see how this happens. Uh, let's read this example. I don't have the answer here, so we're going to look at um, I'm going to solve it. So as of July 2009, Google uh, had no debt. Suppose the firm's managers consider recapitalizing the firm by issuing a zero coupon debt with a face value of 90, uh, 96 billion. Oops. Okay, so face value of debt is 96 billion. 
uh, due in January of 2011 and using the proceeds to pay a special dividend. Suppose Google had 320 million shares outstanding. Numbers of shares is 320 billion. Uh, and trading at uh, 422.27 is the price of, the, of, the comp, uh, of Google, implying a market value of 135.1. So how do you know it? Just multiply these two. Market value of equity will be equal to uh, 135.1 billion. Okay. The risk fear rate over the horizon is 1%. And using the call option codes uh, in the next slide, estimate the credit spread Google would have to pay on the debt assuming perfect capital markets. Oh, okay. So when we have perfect capital markets, uh, we should see that the, the total value of equity and debt of Google should remain the same after recap. So let's just look at, uh, first we need to uh, know, we need to figure out which call option we are going to use. So probably you don't see it, but I'm going to show you when uh, it's necessary. So I have, uh, Google has 96 billion debt. And let's look at the, um, basically, uh, value of debt equivalent in, in the, in the um, try to find debt per share, basically. So I have 96 billion uh, value of debt, and I have uh, 320 billion shares. So per share, I'm going to have th uh, $300 uh, debt. So basically, uh, remember the, the thing we did before, stockholders and debt holder relationship in terms of, uh, of um, <coughs> in, in the options framework. So shareholders will receive this much, uh, sorry, shareholders will only receive money when Google uh, generates more cash than 300. So then in this case, we are interested in the call option value and we need to figure out uh, which call option we are gonna use. So basically, I will just look at a call option which has a strike price of uh, 300. That's the only thing I need to do. This is the value of that per share. And remember, the strike price was equivalent to the value of debt in the previous examples. So I, ne I need to use the, the call option with the $300 strike, which is this one. You don't see it, but it's this one. So from here, I need to figure out the price of the call option. So the bid price here is 148.20. Ask price is 150.10. What you can do is you can take an average of those prices, or if you want, uh, if you want, you can also use the ask price. But in the answer, they use the average of these two, so I'm going <coughs> to use the same thing. So basically, the uh, from the codes, uh, the call option value will be around 149.50. So average of bid and ask. So once you do this, then I'm going to. Since I have three, uh, 320 billion shares outstanding, I need to multiply. I need to buy that much of call option. So I'm going to multiply this with numbers of shares outstanding, which will be equivalent to 47 7 billion. Okay. So the value of equity is 135.1. Uh, I have this um, number, 47.7, which is the ve total value of Google security after the recap. So what am I going to do is I'm interested in value of new debt. So what am I going to do? Original value of equity was 135.1. So if you deduct that 47, 7 billion because of the recapitalization, remember Google had no debt first and we had to buy a call option uh, for the special dividend payment. So I have 74, oops, sorry, no, 87.4 billion of that. So face value of that was 96. This is the value of that uh, in the future. So I'm interested in uh, the, I'm interested in basically the credit spread, if you remember, the question asks, 
uh, the credit spread. What, I'm, uh, uh, what am I going to do is I'm going to use 96 billion, the value of that, face value of that, over 87.4. And this uh, I need the maturity. <coughs> so I have the maturity here. OK, we are in July 2009. Uh, the debt is due January 2011. So I think there are, what, 18 months? So since I'm interested in the credit uh, spread, this is what you need to do. OK. Uh, this is the risk. Um, this is 6.5% uh, is the uh, yield on the debt. But the risky rate is 1%. So what am I going to do is I'm going to take the difference between these two. So the credit spread will be equal to 6.5% minus 1%, which is 5.5%. So basically what we did here is Google kind of had tried to uh, protect itself from, the, from bankruptcy risk, let's say. The risk, risk is 1%, so on top of it, there should be the credit spread uh, that's going to, mm -hmm. together they're going to be equal to the value of the, the, to, uh, the debt, the total uh, yield of the debt. So 6.5% is the uh, debt yield, basically, on, uh, because of this recap. So this is how you can use option framework, again, uh, for um, credit default spreads. It's, very, it's commonly used in the US market. Then, what else do we have? OK, then you can use options framework and mergers. So diversification, do you remember what diversification is? OK, so basically, you're making investments on different things to reduce your risk, OK? Um, and diversification, we are going to talk about mergers later, but diversification is one of the key reasons why uh, mergers occur. Uh, and by their diversification, companies are reducing risk, which is kind of a good thing, I guess. Uh, there's a debate on it, actually. Some people say diversification is bad. Some people say it's good. Um, so now we're going to assume that diversification is the only reason for a merger, and there's no synergies created. So the total value of the company, companies are not going to increase because of any synergies. Uh, but there will be a diversification which will reduce the volatility. And we're going to see uh, what's going to happen to the equity value, what's going to happen to the debt value. OK, so let's look at this example. I think it's very easy to see this over an example. So suppose that we have two merger candidates for a company. And as I said before, diversification is the only reason why uh, we're going to do the merger. And there, there will be no synergies involved. The risk rate is 4%. We have company A and we have company B. Market value of assets is 40 million for company A. Face value of the debt is 18 million. Debt maturity is four years. Uh, asset, uh, asset volatility is 40% for company A. <coughs> for company B, market value of assets is 15. Face value of the debt is seven. Debt maturity is four. And asset volatility is equal to 50%. Now what am I gonna do? Remember, we are taking the total value of the company as like the underlying security, right? So I'm going to take this 40 million like the price of the stock. Remember, we said firms can be seen as the underlying asset of an option. We are looking at firms as options. And face value of the debt was the strike price. Remember our example? We had $800 debt. It was a strike price. It's the same. So this is going to be our exercise price. This is going to be the, the value of the stock. Okay. From here, we will try to understand which one is, is, a, is a better candidate for the merger. Okay. So here, we're using Black-Scholes uh, formulation. Uh, and from here, we're going to calculate, calculate value of debt and value of equity. So now you're going to ask me where this where does this number come from? So we calculate market value of equities using Black-Scholes uh, formula. And then from here, we are deducting this market value of equity from the, uh, from the total assets value. And we are finding the market value of debt. So let's look at this example and try to find those numbers. 
And I'm going to go back to my Excel sheet. Okay. So for this one, uh, I said take stock price like the market value of assets. Then the exercise price will be the face value of debt. Risk-free rate is, I think, 4%. Yes, debt maturity is four years. And asset volatility is 0.4. Okay. So from here, the call value, the market value of equity, will be around 25.68. Maybe due to rounding, the numbers might be different a little bit. But here, it says what? 25.68. Let's see what we found. It should be very similar. Okay. So, yeah, 25.72. Because of rounding, there, there are some differences, but this is how you're going to calculate the market value of equity. After that, from the total assets value, which was 40, right? From 40, deduct market value of equity, it's going to give you market value of debt. So you're going to do the same thing for, the, for company B, okay? So market value of equity will be 988, market value of debt will be 512. Please try to find those numbers at home using that Excel document or by hand, try to find those numbers. Did you understand what we did? We are finding market value of equities using Black and & Scholes and take market value of assets as the stock price, take the um, face value of debt as the exercise price. That's it. Okay, so if those two companies merge, market value of the assets will be 55 from the original slides, if you remember. It says market value of uh, A, market value of B. Then you can calculate the face value of that combined, which is 25. And from here, you can find the market value of equity for the combined firm. Again, you're doing the same thing, okay? You're taking stock price, as 55, market value of assets, exercise price will be 25, face value of debt. This time, because of the merger, volatility decreased. Now the volatility will be 30%. So you're using the new volatility. So market value of equity will be 34, uh, 18 in that case. Deduct this from 55, market value of debt will be 20, 82. So what happened, what we see here is, when you look at separate firms from this slide, okay? If you add these two up, the market value of equities for those two firms will be 35.60. Here, market value of equity for the combined firm, on the other hand, is 34.18. So actually, separate firms, market value of equity is higher. And what happened is, if you look at what debt holders have, so if you um, add those two numbers up, what is the number? Is it 20? No, it is 19. Okay, so if you look at this, then you're gonna see that uh, the market value, okay. Okay, so the, from this total value, the difference between these two numbers, the value is 142, which is gonna be equal to the total increase of, the, of market value of debt. So you're kind of seeing a wealth transfer from stockholders to debt holders, which is another actually uh, uh, source of agency conflict, basically. Okay. So you can also see the firm as an in the options framework, and this is what you can you can see. So basically, when CEOs talk about diversification purposes for mergers. Uh, no synergy though, just diversification, there will be a wealth transfer from stockholders to bondholders. Why? Because merger reduces volatility, when volatility decreases, debt holders are happy, right? And this is called co-insurance effect basically. Uh, when there's less volatility, there will be less bankruptcy. Um, so stockholder value is decreasing, why? Because they have the call option, when volatility decreases, call option value will decrease, so it's gonna be bad for stockholders, okay? So if a manager is interested in maximizing shareholder wealth, then mergers for diversifications are not good, per, uh, are, uh, are not good for stockholders. Okay, so any questions on this? Last couple of things, okay. Okay, now I will show you a couple of very interesting, I think very interesting examples. 
we're, I'm going to show you when uh, stockholders may prefer uh, low MPV projects than high MPV projects or even a negative MPV project. So I know it sounds crazy, but it can happen. And uh, this is kind of what, what we might see in real world as well. So suppose that we are looking at a company. Market value of assets is 40 million. Face value of debt is 25. Debt maturity is five years. Volatility is 40%. Risk rate is 4%. Again, you can use the Excel file to, to calculate the uh, <coughs> value of equity. I'm not going to do it now. The only thing you need to do is plug in numbers. Market value of assets will be my like my stock price. Face value of debt will be like exercise price. That's it. So from here, you can calculate the current market value of equity and current market value of debt. This comes from Black-Scholes. Then you deduct it from market value of assets. Suppose that we have two projects, project one and project two. Project one gives you $3 MPV. Project two gives you $1 uh, MPV. So my market value of assets was 40. When you take project one, market value of assets will increase by three. So mar new market value of assets will be 43. If you take this project, then the market value of assets will be 41. And suppose that the second project is riskier, OK? It has less MPV, but it is riskier, OK? So if you calculate the market value of equity and market value of debt with those numbers, this is what you're going to see. And as you can see, compared to uh, the first project, project two, has higher market value of equity. So which one stockholders will prefer? Project two. Which one debt holders will prefer? Project one, right? So as you can see, stockholders might prefer low MPV projects when they know that their market value of equity will be higher. Why? They like risk. Okay, they're okay with risky projects. Uh, debt holders, on the other hand, they don't like risk. Same agency problem. If you want a negative MPV project, then uh, you can look at this example. So I put a, a, a project with MPV of minus 2 million. <coughs> so the same uh, firm, the mar market value of assets was 40. Since it's negative MPV, new market value of assets will be 38. And suppose that this is even higher risk, 65% of return. With these, if you calculate market value of debt and equity, <coughs> these will be the uh, new values. So this is way higher than $1 MPV and $3 MPV projects. So in that case, uh, equity holders will go with a negative MPV project. Why? They don't have downside, down, downside risk, right? They cannot lose more than their investment. Debt holders, they have to deal with bankruptcy. That's why risk uh, the, uh, stockholders focus on the upside potential. Even if it's risky, if uh, there is a positive return, then it's going to be a huge return for stockholders. They're OK with risk. This is what they're going to do. Debt holders, they will avoid risk like that. And then they're not going to they're going to be they're not going to be OK with uh, high, high risk projects. OK, um, and then the last thing is what we're going to do next week, actually. We are going to use this option framework for real investment decisions for companies. Before, we, all, we only use MPV, right? We say if a project has positive MPV, then we take the project. That's it. But in real life, there are other decisions. Like you, need, you can delay the investment. Uh, you can abandon a project you already undertake. You can have an expansion decision which is actually different than the MPV of project. So next week, we're going to talk about real options, which will give us more decisions uh, for investments, basically. Do you have any questions? Then we are done for today. And I will see you next Thursday. Thursday. Thursday.